standard costing for A-level accounting. Standard costing is a way of costing the products by looking at what you expect the, the individual to actually be. However, it is actually more effectively used as a way of controlling a budget. Remember that the purpose of budgets is to try and monitor the actual activity of a business against what was actually planned or the goals set. Where standard costing is used, it means that you can actually set what you think each particular cost should be and it means that you are then more, a more easily able to actually look at what the variances are and then understand from that. So the standard cost is actually the budgeted cost or the expected goal to be achieved for each individual item. The standard or budgeted cost can then be compared to the actual cost that was incurred for the period. And this difference is known as the variance. In other words, how much the actual cost varied from that that was budgeted. Variances and subvariances for each aspect of the production costs can then be calculated. By subvariances, I mean that for each particular item, it is possible that there are a number of reasons why each item might actually not be the same as that which is budgeted. And these differences of the different individual pieces are known as the subvariances. Don't worry about it too much right now. We'll look at it in more detail on the next slide. Once you've got all the subvariances, you can then add them together to get the total, which will be the total variance for that particular item or the total variance of all the costs. Once you've got the total variances, you can then actually reconcile the total costs and the total profit variances um, because you can look at the different individual variances or subvariances, and if you add them together, that will explain why, for example, your budgeted profit is not the same as the profit that you actually expected. Sorry, although it's not the same as what you actually achieved. A detailed analysis of the variances is obviously quite important. Once you've done your analysis, you can then discuss or look very carefully into what the causes might be and then hopefully find possible solutions if there are any problems. Or where you find that the variances are favorable, you can then go and analyze why they are favorable and possibly take what you've learned in that area and apply it to a different area of the production as well. First, we're going to have a look at the direct cost variances. Remember that direct costs are your direct materials and your direct labor. If you have a look at either of these, let's start with the material costs. The differences could be either because of the usage of materials. In other words, maybe you used more materials than you expected or less materials than expected. Either of these would result in your actual costs being different to those budgeted. In other words, a variance. So the usage of materials is known as a sub-variance because it is a subcategory of your material costs. However, that is not the only reason why the material costs might vary. Another reason could be a change in the price. Maybe for some reason the price was higher than expected. Possibly you are importing the product and exchange rates changed um, and this would then result in a price that is higher than was expected. In addition, you can have exactly the same sub-variances for direct labor costs. Although we will label them slightly differently, it's basically the same thing. If we look at material cost usage, we're looking at the quantity, in other words, how much materials. Direct labor, we can also look at how much, in other words, how many hours were actually used. Maybe the labor was more efficient and they were able to produce the items in less hours or maybe less hours were worked because the workers went on strike. There's a number of reasons why, but basically it means that your hours might actually be more or less than what you expected and we call this the labor efficiency. At the same time, the wage rate or labor rate Again, the monetary figure might be higher or lower than what was actually expected. When you are looking at subvariances, it's very important that you need to keep one constant variable. In other words, you want to make sure that you are actually comparing apples with apples. If you're looking at a change in your material costs and you're looking 
only at a change in usage and your price stayed the same, then you can see that you will get a valid answer. However, if your price changed and the price that you're using in your budget compared to the actual price is not the same and you look at the change in quantity without factoring in that your price has changed, your answer is not going to be very valid. So it's quite important that what you do is you calculate your usage subvariance, assuming that price stayed the same, and then you calculate the price variance, assuming that usage should have stayed the same. Even though it didn't, you work out what it would be if it had been the same. And then when you add these two together, you'll get a much more meaningful material cost variance. It's also very important that if you are calculating your variance, you need to specify if it's favorable, in other words, it's positive or the budgeted cost is more than what it actually turned out to be, in other words, you have a saving, or if it is adverse, in other words, the costs were higher than expected, or your actual cost was more than that which was budgeted. Um, and quite simply, if you take whatever your budget cost is and you subtract your actual cost, you will then get an answer that is either positive, indicating that it's favorable, or negative, indicating that it is adverse. Do you keep these signs there so that when you add them all together later on, sometimes you'll find that you've got one subvariance that is perhaps favorable and another one that is adverse. You need to look at them together to see whether the net effect was actually favorable or adverse. You also need to make sure that when you are specifying the variance, you specify favorable or adverse. In other words, we like it. Or we don't but obviously don't just use those terms use the terms that are given here favorable for positive or adverse for negative here are the little formulas that you're going to use um, the first thing is if you're looking at the quantity or the hours so the how much of your materials you are using um, the number or the number of hours that are being worked what you're going to do is for the budget, obviously, you will take your standard quantity, how many you expected there to be, times your standard price, whether it is the price of the raw materials or the labor rate. And that will give you your actual figure that was on your budget. You then keep one of these constant. Um, because we are looking at our change in quantity, we will keep our standard price constant. So you can see that in our comparison, we've kept the standard as the same. And instead, we are now looking at the actual quantity. So you can see that if we're looking at what the quantity variance is, we are comparing standard quantity to actual quantity while keeping the price constant. The difference will then tell you what your quantity variance actually is. We can then look at the monetary value, in other words, whether it be the cost of the actual items or the labor rate. And again, we need to keep one of these constant. Now, because we used actual quantity last, what we're going to do is we're going to use the actual quantity that we um, that we had, so the number that there actually was, and we'll keep that as our constant, and we will change the price. So for the budgeted figure, we'll use the standard price that we expected, and for our actual, we'll use the actual price. So you can see that over here, the second box is in fact the total actual price um, and over here we are just keeping the quantity the same and using the standard price for comparison. Notice over here that this would be your actual budgeted figure what you expected and then you change one of them if you're looking for quantity you change the quantity. Over here this is your total actual um, value that you incurred, so the actual cost that was paid out, um, but because you're looking at the for, for the value, you keep the quantity constant, and so that's why in this instance you're using the actual quantity times the standard price.
The next thing we need to consider is a flexed budget. Now, you did look at a flexed budget um, in AS level, uh, sorry, in, uh, yes, in AS level accounting. Um, and the idea of a flexed budget is simply saying that when you budget for particular costs, you generally are assuming a certain level of production, particularly for all your variable costs. Because in order to determine what you think your variable costs are going to be, you needed to predict what the level of production would be and then multiply. However, in reality, your actual production will probably not be exactly the same. So it's quite important to then flex the budget. In other words, you take your budget co um, costs as you expected and you then flex them to change to the actual production level that actually occurred. So these flexed budgeted figures or flexed standard costs can then be compared to the actual costs to, com to determine your variances as we've just been doing. So all that happens when you're using a flexed budget is it means that you start with your initial budget where you didn't know anything um, and you were just setting your goals. Then once you know how much you've actually um, produced, you then flex the budget. So you say, OK, given the fact that we didn't produce what we expected, what should the costs have been based on the actual production? And then once you've got your flexed budget, you can then compare it to the actual costs. And so the variances will be the, the variances between your flexed budget or your flexed standard costs and the actual costs over here. That gives you a much more realistic um, set of variances that you can then analyze and discuss. Let's now have a look at our overhead cost variances. Remember that overheads are generally fixed. And as such, um, you would expect that what you budget would be the same regardless of the production levels. However, if you are using absorption costing, absorption costing means that you are um, trying to allocate all your different costs, um, including your overhead costs. And in this case, your overhead costs are divided amongst the expected number of units to be produced. And therefore, what's happening is you are, again, working on what you expect your production to be. And so if production changes, it means that you're going to have variances between your budgeted overheads and your actual overheads, even though actually overheads should remain fixed. So again, you can look at your total variances and your sub variances for all your overhead expenses. Let's have a look at the different things that you can actually work out. The total fixed overhead variance is where you take your standard absorption rate, in other words, how you expected your overheads to be absorbed. And remember that this could be um, against number of units or labor hours. It depends on whether you are capital intensive or labor intensive business, and you will then determine how you're going to absorb those costs. Um, and you would then take your absorption rate and times it by the actual production, so in other words, you're saying my budgeted rate times what I actually produced compared to the actual overhead cost. And that difference will give me my total fixed overhead variance because it's taking into account the fact that um, my absorption rate was um, maybe I would have under or over absorbed because my actual production differed to um, what I was expecting. Right. Um, you can then look at your fixed overhead expenditure variance. Now, this is probably the easiest one because it's the most logical. You just take your total budgeted overhead cost and compare it to the actual overhead cost that you achieve. So it's your most obvious um, variance. Um, it's literally just taking the two RAND value figures and comparing them. You can also look at your fixed overhead volume variance. In other words, you look at what was your total budgeted overhead cost, so the amount in the budget based on the budgeted production and your um, standard rates, and you compare that to your standard absorption rate times the actual production. In other words, the absorption rate that you expected times the actual production. Um, notice that these figures over here are what are uh, are actually going to be the same. Um, you might find it useful to actually notice that here you've got your budgeted figures, here you've got your actual overhead costs, and then have a look. This is a combination of the budgeted rate but with the actual production. In other words, it's more like the flexed one.
Your fixed overhead capacity variance is again taking your initial budgeted overhead cost and um, comparing it to your standard absorption rate times your actual hours. So um, again, it's looking, it's similar to looking at your volume variance. Um, it's just that you are looking at the number of hours worked instead of the number of units produced. That is the difference here. But otherwise, these two formulae are pretty similar. And then lastly, we can look at the fixed overhead volume efficiency variance, um, where we look at what the standard absorption rate is times the actual hours compared to the budgeted overhead cost. So there's a variety of different things that you can look at over here. Um, and all of these will just give you slightly different meanings or variances, which you can then look at more carefully to understand why the budget is different to the actual. Sales variances we'll look at in a very similar way to looking at your direct variances. Um, these are calculated in the same way as for the direct costs. In other words, you can look at the quantity and you look at, can look at the value, in this case, the selling price. So it's the quantity sold and the selling price. And remember how we did this one was we put the budgeted amount in the top corner here or standard quantity times the standard price. We then, because we're looking at quantity, we're going to keep our price constant. So we put standard price um, in the comparison box and we want to look at the actual quantity. So that's how we're going to calculate our quantity variance. And then the selling price, we want to look at the total actual quantity times actual price. But in this case, we want to keep the quantity constant. And so we use as the budget the standard price. The difference between the two, in other words, your budgeted figures less your actual figures, will then give you your variance that you need for the sales. You can then analyze all these variances. Remember that at the beginning of the section we said that this is vitally important for budgetary control. You want to look at what were your plans and how well have you achieved those plans. So standard costing allows you to control your costs better because you have a much better idea of what the amounts should have been and a much better understanding of how they differed or varied. The detailed variances can then be calculated and analyzed carefully to understand why they arose. Um, and these reasons for the variances must be determined. You want to understand why the amounts were not those that you expected. And this will then lead to much better decision making so that you can change your plans in the future or change your activities in the future accordingly so that you are able to actually meet your goals. We need to also, as part of this process, reconcile the costs. Sometimes it helps to understand why my total costs differed by looking at each of the individual variances. Basically, what you'll do is you'll start with your budgeted standard costs, so what you came up with initially. You would then flex it, as we spoke about it before. It's quite important to flex your budget and work out your actual standard costs based on your actual production. You then add all the different variances, your direct materials, which would be both for quantity and for price, direct labor for quantity and for price, and your fixed overheads again for quantity and for price. And you would then look at all of these together to work out the actual costs. Remember that over here, if the um, different variances were adverse, you need to keep them as negative so that you can subtract them. I always like to show them in brackets if they're negative um, and add them if they are positive or favorable. And once you do that, remember that you are going to start here with your actual standard cost rather than what was budgeted because it's got to be flexed for production. You then add or subtract the different variances and you should arrive at the actual costs that were achieved. Um, this is a one way of checking that your variance calculations have actually been done correctly. Similarly, you can then reconcile the profits. Reconciling the profits is exactly the same. The only difference is that you also factor in your sales. So you would start again with your budgeted profit and then you would need to flex this profit. Um, and flexing the profit simply means adjusting your sales for the actual production as well as your other um, standard costs for the production.
and so you'd then work out your flexed budget profit. So this calculation is a little bit more complex. Um, you might like to do it as a little note on the side, but it is very logical. It's just saying, what did you actually expect your profit to be, given the fact that your production levels were not the same as what you actually expected? Once you've got that, you will factor in your sales price variance. So notice this line has come in as a new one. But then the direct materials, direct labor, and fixed overhead variances are all shown just as we did before. Again, for each one, you would split it up into your quantity and your price. Um, and you might also like to have columns for one is favorable, one is unfavorable, etc. Myself, I just like to keep it in one column and show it as uh, positives or negatives. And if you do that and you start with your flexed budget profit, adding and subtracting your sales price variances and your materials and labor and overheads variances, you will get your actual profit. The one thing to keep in mind though is when you're looking at your sales price variance, um, remember that in this case, if your um, actual amounts were higher than those expected, this would actually be favorable, not unfavorable. That's quite important. You then want to discuss your variances quite carefully. So firstly, you need to understand that your standard costs might be wrong. Generally, we want to assume that they are correct, but in reality, you might have set them as unrealistic. You might have thought that, oh, you know, people will be able to produce so many units in a certain number of hours, but actually you were not factoring in that they need breaks or they will tire over time, etc. So if you've set unrealistic goals, it means that your standard costs are not going to be correct. The other reason that your costs might be unrealistic is maybe your managers want to have very easy goals and therefore they set the goals too low or they set the costs as quite high um, so that it's very, very easy to achieve. Ideally, you want to sort out that you don't have any of these errors to start with. If you Once you're sure that your standard costs are generally correct, you can then have a look at the actual costs and see where they might be incorrect for whatever reason. And there are a variety of reasons. You need to think logically and realistically. I always like to visualize what the actual situation is, even imagine what does the storeroom look like, what does the factory look like, um, what are the machines that are moving up and down, where are the people sitting, and imagine what the actual causes could be. Maybe in your factory your machines are set far too far apart and therefore it's taking too long for the workers to get one product from one place to another. There are all sorts of reasons that it could be, but come up with realistic causes based on whatever information has been given to you. Sometimes they will tell you that the factory is very large but they're not using forklifts or something like that. You could then factor these into your answer. And once you've identified what the actual causes might be, you can then come up with possible solutions. There are a number of, of specific um, causes that you could apply to all the, each of the different sub-variances, and you can go and learn these, um, but I want you to imagine them at the same time, because actually you can come up with your own solutions just by visualizing the situation carefully. You can also realize that some of these subvariances may be linked. The reason for one subvariance may also affect the reason for another subvariance. Um, and they might both be adverse, or one might be adverse and the other favorable. And it is important to point these out if you identify them. Hopefully, you now have a much better understanding of standard costs, what they are, and why we use them, and how best to use them. And you will now be able to manage your production much more efficiently.